aspects of aortic disease and acute aortic syndromes. So really, this is the basis of our talk today. We're, we're going to brush upon aortic dissection, intramural hematomas, uh, penetrating aortic ulcers, and aortic aneurysms with uh, leaks and ruptures, and look a little bit about uh, diagnostics pertaining to these uh, disease modalities. This is a study from uh, a, a Swedish registry uh, uh, between the years 87 and 2002, and you can see there has been a real increase in the uh, uh, incidence of aortic, uh, thoracic aortic pathologies during this time frame, uh, staggering 52% in men. And this is not all due to the fact that we're getting best, better diagnostically, but there actually seems to be a true increase in the incidence of these diseases. The in-hospital mortality overall for these disease groups is a staggering 34%, but uh, luckily the surgical mortality has, in, has improved uh, significantly over this time period. When it comes to diagnostics, these are really the modalities that we're going to uh, look upon in this setting. We're going to look about, uh, on CT, MRIs, uh, ultrasound, and an angiographies. <coughs> And for the purpose of the talk, of course, and you all want to see beautiful pictures, I'm not going to show you a lot of ultrasound data because I don't have it. Uh, but I'm sure that as thoracic surgeons, uh, most of you are very familiar with the use of, uh, of uh, transthoracic trans and uh, transesophageal echoes. So what are the goals of our diagnostic tools in these settings? Well, of course, we want to delineate the, ex the disease extent, and we want to detect any uh, complications that pertain to the pathology uh, in the pericardium or pleura, uh, and also signs of rupture or impending rupture. We want to see and assess our branch involvement, because that falls back on how we're going to approach the uh, particular repair. And in the case of um, uh, dissections, we want to differentiate between the true and the false lumen. And of course, uh, if you're approaching this from an endovascular view and from an open surgical view, you want to look and see where are your intimal tears when it comes to dissections so you know how to uh, approach it. So a quick look at what CT can do for us. Well, it's fast, it's very available in most departments, very reproducible. Uh, the downside, of course, that is that it, uh, you have to give the patient contrast. In a sense, uh, and in the current setting, it's a static uh, investigation looking at pathologies that are very dynamic, as I will show you uh, later. And the post-processing and the ability to get a good overview might be cumbersome, especially in an acute setting. And we'll talk a little bit about new uh, post-processing uh, capabilities. When you do a CT scan, of course, it's very, it's imperative that you do a non-contrast run first before your contrast run, and this is particularly true when you're looking at intramural hematomas, and I'll show you that later. And then you run your contrast enhanced CT from the neck down to your femoral vessels. We often include the brain because as being slanted towards endovascular treatment, it becomes very important for us to see um, the circulation to the brain in the circle of Willis if we're going to cover or include any vessels in the... Uh, uh, arch and the proximal descending aorta. Pul uh, the pitfalls with a CT, of course, are the pulsation artifacts, and you're all familiar with that, that especially in the ascending aorta, when you're looking at acute dissections or, or intramural hematomas, you're going to get a lot of pulsation artifacts, and you really need to get your department to do an e ECG-gated uh, study to rule out uh, or to take away those uh, movement artifacts. And also be aware that normal periaortic anatomy can mimic a dissection and other surrounding tissues can confuse you and mi uh, mimic periaortic hematoma. So you have to fiddle around with your pictures a little bit to get the information you need. So how about MRIs? Well, the spatial resolution is very high. Uh, it's less nephrotoxic. Not that gadolinium in itself is less nephrotoxic than iodine-based contrast, but the volume you use is so much less. However, when you're doing this in the middle of the night, it becomes very unavailable. It's technically very demanding to set up good MR protocols. And you'll have some contraindications with patients who have implanted pacemakers or other, other metal objects. Angiography, of course, um, used to be the gold standard in this in these uh, disease processes, and the, the temporal resolution is excellent. You get a live view of your pathology, and you can go on to do therapeutic interventions if you want in that setting. However, it is an invasive procedure. You tend to use a lot of contrast in these patients who are often in <clears throat> severe distress and, and, and perhaps also in renal failure 
You can only see the luminal side of the vessel, so any pathology that lies in the aortic wall or outside of the aortic wall, of course, you can't see. And the question is, how available is this in most departments? Then, of course, uh, ultrasound, and you'll, you'll, you might um, object here that I've lumped it all to be together into one, um, because these are, uh, use the same technology, the TTE, the TE, and the IVUS but they're based on the same baseline technology. Again, you have high temporal resolution in this, and you can see real-time diagnostics. Uh, as far as the ascending aorta, of course, uh, you can look at the valve and, 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 and the pericardium for diagnostics. You can use it as a perioperative monitoring, and that goes for, for, for IVUS as well, and you don't need any contrast. So it's very available, and I'm sure that most of you working in thoracic departments um, have this readily available. Now, as a vascular surgeon, if I call somebody to do a, a, a perioperative uh, transesophageal uh, echo in the middle of the night, I won't get it. Um, and you have to be good at it, so not anybody can do it, because then you won't get the information you need. And, of course, you can only see a limited area of the aorta. You can look at the ascending uh, aorta, the arch, uh, and, and maybe the proximal descending, but uh, apart from that, you can't really see downstream so let's start looking a little bit about uh, dissection. You all know that's an intimal tear, of course, and you get blood into the subintimal layer. And this is the standard classification. You'll see the DeBakey classification up top and the more commonly used Sanford type A classification. This has shifted slightly uh, with the introduction of endovascular procedures because then you take into account more from a therapeutic option what you can uh, accomplish. This uh, is an intraoperative angiogram of a, a type B dissection. Very nice image here. You can see the, uh, the entry tear up here, and you can see the filling of the false lumen. And remember, of course, that uh, you can have different types of obstructions uh, when you have a type B dissection. You can have a dissection that goes contiguous into the branching vessel in a static fashion, uh, or you can have a dynamic um, obstruction which varies with the flow of the vessel. And depending on what type it is, you might have different approaches to your therapeutics. An important point here, of course, with dissections is that you have to act, and you have to act really fast, because the mortality is very high during the first 24 hours, maybe even higher than the 25%. This is both type A and B, and it's very high during the first week. So you can't really stay at home and wait for something good to happen, because something good is not going to happen. See if I can get this running. I'm afraid to push any button. Okay. <laughs> can you get this movie running? <laughs> worked in the preview room. I'm sorry about this. You try to have, like you said, you try to have some preview in the world. Yeah, they, they, they put it on the network and it doesn't because the, the, the driver isn't in the time. Just move on. And there are so many more things. Okay. 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 There are so many uh, compression modes. So. Mm. I mean, it's a pain that the industry couldn't agree on a standard for videos, even if it's maybe not so clear if it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a new we didn't get it. It won't work. Off. It won't work. No. It's bad. Yeah. These won't work. Okay. Bit of a shame. Um, I'm always a little bit nervous about putting movies into presentations because half of the time they don't work. This, uh, these are actually the, the previous slide showed uh, just a, uh, the CT view of a, of a dissection, type B dissection, and these are really MR images and. and and the purpose of showing you movies here was actually to show you that uh, as this movie will run, and this one, this is the same patient, um, you can see the, um, 
uh, entomal membrane, the dissection membrane, flapping to and fro in the aorta, and you can also see the, uh, the blood squirting from the true to the false lumen. And, and the images are really very uh, illustrative of, of the dynamic process in a type B dissection, uh, which varies a lot from what you see in a typical CT, where you can get the perception that the membrane is very static. And of course, when you open the aorta and you look at this, uh, most of the time, uh, either the patient is on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and nothing is moving. But um, uh, if you look in, in MR and you can do real-time MRs, you can see that, and it's quite impressive. So here just uh, another uh, image of a type B dissection here, and you can see how this has affected the downward flow in the aorta with cutoff uh, circulation to the membranes. Put a stent graft in, and by closing the entry tier and um, opening the true lumen, as you can see here, you can see the true lumen before and the true lumen after, you can see that we've reperfused the visceral vessels. Another picture here showing a type B dissection uh, with a massive uh, rupture into the left pleural. And this was also treated with an endovascular graft uh, with a nice end result. So how about intramural hematomas? Well, intramural hematomas are really a subtype of dissections that don't have intimal tears. Um, you have a bleeding in the subintimal or medial layer. Uh, and this is really what you see when you open the aorta. If you run your unenhanced CT scan, you'll see this high attenuation crescent. If you run a contrast enhanced scan, you'll see this. And you can't really be sure if that's a he an intramural hematoma or just thrombus in the wall uh, intraluminally. And you have to fiddle around and change your window settings, as you can see here, to get a good view of what you want to see. And you can see the contrast lighting up here, and here you can hardly see it. So don't take it at face value what they're showing you at the radiology department. You use to learn the tools and use them yourself, and you'll get much further. And here again, you'll see on this non-enhanced scan, the low attenuation here, and you'll see this, uh, uh, um, this uh, thrombus in the wall right here. Again, another picture showing this high echogenicity here uh, when the non-contrast scan and then in the contrast scan you can't really see. So remember to do, to do both modalities. So what do we do with the intramural hematomas? Well, this is a nice picture of an acute hematoma. This is a picture a month later and it's completely regressed. And in this study from Evangelista, they looked at their... Um, intramural hematomas, and what they found was, is, was, as Mike Dake usually puts it, a flip of the coin, what will happen to these patients? Half of them will regress, and half of them will turn into some uh, uh, complicating pathology that needs treatment. So it's very hard to tell which patients should we treat and sh which shouldn't we treat. And they looked at some predisposing factors, and they, they looked at the thickness of the hematoma and the maximum diameter of the aorta and found that there was a correlation. Uh, and also the presence of an ulcerated plaque was a ba bad diagnostic sign for, for a benign uh, intramural hematoma. And the mortality, of course, in the ascending aorta when you have a, a hematoma is very high again. So you really need to figure out which patients should I treat and how should I follow these patients. And there's no doubt that when you have an intramural hematoma in the ascending aorta, there, there's plenty of data out there to support that you should be very aggressive in your surgical therapy, whereas in the descending aorta, you can be a little bit more conservative. And, and the pathology of intramural hematoma, as I, sh as I told you, uh, is slightly related to the presence of a penetrating aortic ulcer, or at least it aggravates that pathology. And the incidence of uh, aortic rupture is, is about is between 10 and 40 percent in this setting, and it has a, an equal or higher risk than that of an acute dissection or a simple intramural hematoma. This is uh, a uh, CT with a 3D rendering of that, and you can see this uh, aortic ulcer penetrating up here. And the indicators for uh, disease progression in the setting of, of uh, penetrating aortic ulcers is, is quite similar to when you look at other thoracic pathologies, uncontrollable pain, increasing pleural effusion, and, in, and then this, the diameter of the ulcer of more than 20 millimeters or a depth of more than 10, and then you can recommend er, early surgical or endovascular treatment. 
Uh, so moving, moving away and moving forward towards aneurysms, of course, you know the definitions. I'd just like, to, like you to keep in mind that the, the baseline definition of what is an aneurysm in the thoracic aorta, of course, is a simple diameter measurement. But as you all know, we have to take into account the diameter of the remaining aorta that is not diseased because that's important to take into account. Uh, and, and uh, aorta megal uh, conditions, and also that it really varies with age, gender, and body size. So a small woman, of course, with a five centimeter descending is, that's a big descending. Uh, a, a large man with uh, more aortomegalic features and has a five centimeter descending, you would probably leave. And the complications are the standard ones for aortic uh, for aneurysms. Uh, they can rupture, they can dissect, you can get regurg uh, and compression of adjacent structures. And really, in the setting of, of an acute rupture, of course, there's no question of, that you have to intervene because otherwise the patient will die. And the more difficult situation is, is, is of course, what we call the acute or impending rupture. And how do we tell that and how do we delineate that from something that is stable and we can treat in an elective setting? Um, well, hemorrhage, of course, is a rupture. But if you have a high attenuation crescent of blood within a mural thrombus or a draping sign, uh, that will be a, a sign that something is going on. Uh, and this is the crescent sign. I don't know if it shows very well on the, on the big screen, but there's a, a crescent sign here in the thrombus. Uh, and that's been shown to uh, predict uh, rupture. This is what we call the draping sign when the aorta sort of seems to be weakened in the wall and hangs out of the vertebral column and that should also make you very cautious. Um, if you have these pathologies as this uh, arch aneurysm, of course, you can use the, f you, can, you can always discuss what type of diagnostics do I need for this and we used to do these uh, we used to do CAT scans on these patients and then we'd take them to the uh, angio suite and do an angiogram to, to get uh, correct measurements and interrelationships. Uh, but really with the use of multi-detector CT, spiral CT scanners, 64 row, 128 row scanners, you don't need to do that anymore and I'm just showing this as an example uh, of that. This is the angiogram shot on this patient and you can tell here um, but you really don't get a lot of more information from doing the angiogram as pertaining to the aorta than you get here. In fact, you get much less because if you're processing this in a 3D workstation, you can rotate this image around, you can look at it at different angles, you can actually crawl inside the vessel and look at it from a vessel view. So you get much more information from this. Uh, so I think the baseline is to get a very good CAT scan when you're working up these patients. And this, this is not some sort of special CAT scan. It's been done, and you can get a lot of information. You can pull it out into a stretch vessel view like this and see all the takeoff vessels uh, in the aorta as well. And looking a little bit into uh, to the future of imaging, what we're getting more and more into is the fusion imaging with PET CTs and, and, and angio created CT-like images, DynaCT or Expert CT, and superimposing CT images in the, uh, onto the C-arm in the operating room so you can look at the 3D vessel anatomy in real time and work off of that CT image. Dual source CT where you can actually take away the need for using a non-contrast run because you use different voltages uh, two detectors with different voltages in your CT scanner, one that's better for detecting soft tissue and one for detecting uh, high attenuation structures, and you can get all the information and the, therefore less radiation in a shorter time. And the dynamic CT runs, which you unfortunately uh, couldn't see, and the MR runs where you can study pulsatility and, and wall mobility and detect areas of possible weakness. And he also a lot of new interesting studies with MRI looking at plaque vulnerabilities. Can you conclude? Yeah, two more images. So these are just some examples uh, of that, uh, where you can look at the high stress. This is the bottom of the endograph with an MR. And uh, with PET-CT scannings, which you can use for uh, looking at glucose upt uptake in, in uh, infected uh, grafts or whatnot and also looking at wall stress. So in summary, aortic syndromes carry very high mortality and rapid diagnosis is necessary. I think today it's safe to say that CT is the diagnostic tool of choice because it's fast, available, transferable from outside institutions and reproducible. But for perioperative evaluation 
um, I would say that uh, transesophageal uh, echo, of course, in the cardiac setting in IVUS and the, uh, and the more distal uh, uh, thoracic aorta is also very uh, valuable tools. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for <laughs>